Thank you for taking the time to watch this episode of Life Support. If you enjoy the content, we would ask that you like it, hit subscribe, and share it with your friends. It's so great to have you on Life Support. What we do in this program is we tell stories, and we want you to find a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. And sometimes God uses suffering and trauma to make that happen. And it's not fun to talk about, but Wow, we find a lot more of who God is when we talk about these issues. And so we're so glad to have a storyteller with us today, Chris Cruzen, who is the uh, filmmaker, writer, the president of Messenger Films. And I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for dropping by. Thank you. You have some um, really interesting stuff going on. Why don't you just spend a moment, if you would, before we talk about what's happening right now, what are some of the things that you've done in the past, and how did you get to the point you are today? Well, I decided in college to major in filmmaking after I started out as an English literature major. I became really interested in filmmaking as a potential career when I began seeing mainly foreign films at the time at the university where I was a student. They would have film retrospectives, and so I would see these films that are considered classics of cinema, but that normally here in, this, here in the United States, a young person would probably never have heard about or seen. And that just began to pique my curiosity in a tremendous way. And I always enjoyed acting, uh, writing. I had hoped, or my, my plan was to become a writer, uh, even a poet. That was my secret desire, was that I could become a published poet and as, as um, unlikely as it may have seemed, make a living from being a poet. I mean, that's kind of what I had my eyes set on at that time. But watching a number of these foreign films in particular began to open my eyes to the artistic potential in cinema. And I began to think, well, look, you want to be a storyteller, a writer, you, you, you want to be a poet, maybe you can do all of that in filmmaking. And... So I actually transferred out of that particular university to go to NYU in New York City mm -hmm. and concentrated on film. Uh, well, that was my major, filmmaking. And when I graduated from NYU, I began to work in New York City at a local production company there in Manhattan. And then I decided, well, if I'm really gonna make it um, on the big stage, so to say, uh, without having contacts, because I didn't have connections in the industry, I thought, I'm gonna follow the example of others who've gone before me who wrote a script, a screenplay, and then they attach themselves to the script. Mm -hmm. So if Hollywood were to become interested in optioning that script, you would have, you as the writer would come with it. Right. Sylvester Stallone famously did that with Rocky. Interesting. As one, as one example. It seemed to work out pretty well for him yeah, too. Yeah, right? Yeah. So that was sort of my plan. And in the midst of this, and we're talking now uh, the late 70s, early 80s, I, I, I began uh, what I can only call a spiritual quest. I began searching for truth with a capital T. I said, if, you know, in fact, I'm sitting here at a table and I would rap on the table in my apartment in New York and and just question, is there more than what meets the eye? Mm. Is there more than the material world that I can touch and see and feel? Is it possible that there's something more that exists? Mm -hmm. And that was just a burning question. And I began searching for truth and meaning. It took me on this journey through all the major religions of the world. I read their holy books and just be, you know, searching, searching, searching. The last holy book I read was the Bible. <laughs> um, and then for a number of, well, a couple of years anyway, uh, after I came to faith in Christ, and that's another story as to how that happened, if you will, but for a number of years, I didn't want to be a filmmaker. I thought, well, the best way I can serve God is to be a missionary. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea what that entailed at all. I did not grow up in a Christian home. I thought a missionary would be, you know, being someone like Albert Schweitzer, maybe. That was the closest I could come to it. Or yeah. 
joined the Red Cross. I mean, they right. had a cross in their logo, right? There right. Must be something. Has to be something there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then I got back uh, to filmmaking, and that's sort of where it started, but from a different orientation, different perspective, uh, which mm -hmm. was one of, I believe in Christ. Uh, if he's gifted me to make films or wants me to be a filmmaker, well, what now? And I wasn't sure. <laughs> yeah. But that's how it began. That's, that's really interesting. What is it about story that binds people together before you walked in today we were all talking about we got talking about movies mm, mm. and we all can think of movies that in our time you know as our lives progressed and the, the big movie that's out right now with tom cruise and we're talking yeah. about all this it kind of brings people together what is it about story that's so intriguing and and, yeah. and so binding together i think at heart we're all children um really when you, you get down to it no matter how old you are there's a childlike quality that you never lose, <clears throat> and who loves a story more than a child, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's story time, and you know the children will flock together to hear a story, and surely Jesus understood that. Yes, uh, yes, because he, he talked master parables. storyteller. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I, I think uh, I, I I have a theory that uh, I, I'm not sure if I am the first to think of it. I doubt that I am. But the idea that uh, film in our culture today is the equivalent of uh, the people in the village gathering around the fire and listening to the village elder or storyteller tell a, spin a tale, and we're all fascinated. Mm -hmm. and, you know, in a darkened movie theater, people still go to movie theaters. Yep, you're kind of there in the dark, and the screen is emitting light you know mm -hmm. and 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 there you are and you're kind of wound bound up in the story you're lost you in the story lost, yeah. well you have quite a story and speaking of children uh let me have my son as a project uh that you're working on right now um but there's so much tied to that in your own mm -hmm. personal life yeah um tell me about your son tell me about the journey uh that you've been on to you know, up to the point here where now where you're making this movie. Hmm. Well, <clears throat> remember I said earlier I became a, a believer. Uh, it was probably was within two years that my first son was born. <clears throat> His name is Daniel. Today he's 39. Um, I, I mean, he, I always wanted children. You know, from. I guess my late teens, early 20s, I was wanting to have children. And along came Daniel. <clears throat> I'm 30 years old, and he's a beautiful, everything I could want as a father uh, was kind of wrapped up in that boy. And I, I was, frankly, I was kind of boastful about him. You know, <laughs> he, mm -hmm. he had, I learned what an APGAR, an APGAR is some sort of test they give newborns, and <clears throat> excuse me, he scored a 10 on the app girl. That's like a perfect score. Um, he began walking at 10 months, talking. Um, we were just so close. And he was a beautiful child who grew up uh, to become a very, you could tell, he had tremendous athletic ability, even as a child. I, I mean, I'm speaking to the dads now, you know, hand-eye coordination. Yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> he just, he was exceptional. Yeah. <clears throat> and then you realized also how fast he could run. He mm -hmm. was a sprinter. Uh, and he just had these amazing gifts. And so also <clears throat> on, the, uh, on the spiritual side of things, I was teaching Daniel. On the spiritual side, the connection was also very strong. Uh, Daniel became, I hate to say it, but a bit of a guinea pig for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. he, you know, I just would pray with him and read the Bible to him and help him memorize scripture verses from the age of two or three. He was quoting scripture even to this day. Um, John 14, 6, Daniel, mm. and he'll tell me what John 14, 6 says. And so a normal, exceptional child in many respects who went off the rails to mm. cut to the chase. Mm -hmm. 
uh, trauma in the home, dysfunction in the home, sadly. Um, and I'd rather not go into those details exactly, uh, to be quite honest, but there, there, were, there was dysfunction in the home. Um, there was, uh, there were, let's just say there were, there were um, issues of mental illness in the home. And I really thought that as difficult as they were, uh, he would be spared. I mean, after all, it's not, it's not like mental illness is contagious, right? Right. And yet, <clears throat> Daniel did develop uh, mental illness. It may have been triggered by drug use, which sadly he got into in his early teens, you know, as young as 13, 14, he began experimenting with drugs. And the psychiatrists have, that we've met over the years have kind of mm, somewhat um, unanimously conjectured, I'll say, that his, the onset of his mental illness or the schizophrenia began as the result of the drug use, that it triggered a genetic predisposition. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they're right or not. Mm -hmm. They might be. Um, the sad part and the tragic part and the difficult part over these years has been dealing with uh, a young man, now a man of 39, who uh, is afflicted, you know, he's afflicted. He's currently institutionalized um, in St. Peter here in Minnesota. But we're, we're hopeful that he'll be able to leave because he is doing better and has been doing better for two and a half years now. He's been showing marked improvement. And so we're hopeful that he will be discharged soon and be able to, this is what he wants too, you know, yeah. be, be able to live in a group home setting and that sort of thing. And I would certainly love that to be able to spend more time with him and for, for him to have a better quality of life because where he is now in that institutional setting, it's grim. And, and I, and I want to give credit to the people there because they do try and they work with him and he's safe. When I think of the hundreds of thousands of mentally ill people who are on the street. Safe is a big deal. Or in, or in prison. Yeah. You know, that's right. The, the psychiatric hospitals mm -hmm. nowadays are often yep. held in prison. Yep. So, so you had um, come to know Christ. You have your son. Um, and then things begin to unravel a little bit. And where, where were you with God at this point? Where were you faith-wise? Was this testing your faith? Were you yeah. looking at God saying, oh, wait a minute, this isn't the way life is supposed to go? Sure. No, it's a great question. And in my case, it, it was uh, the answer. There's a multiple, there are multiple answers to the mm -hmm. question because I began with a sort of triumphant posture of I've never been into the quote unquote prosperity gospel. It never, as a, as a new believer, it just struck me wrong. It, it never resonated with me. Mm -hmm. I just didn't take to it. Having said that, hey, I read the Bible. Jesus went about healing all who were oppressed of the devil. You know, he mm -hmm. went about doing good and healing mm -hmm. all and um, call for the elders of the church and let them pray and he'll be healed. I, right. I still believe in healing. Sure. I do. Uh, and certainly then, when this happened with Daniel, I had that attitude. Well, okay, he's sick, but he will be healed because I have prayed. And then I you know, reached out to others and began to form a group of support and sent out monthly prayer letters advising them of where we were and what mm -hmm. we needed to be praying for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but at the same time, I had my I had my moments of great doubt and struggle and deep disappointment. And yes, disappointment with God, for sure. I remember, um, and this was actually before he was committed. At the age of 18, he was civilly committed. That is, against his will, mm -hmm. he was civilly committed to the state mental hospital in Williamsburg, Virginia, where we were living at the time. And I remember before that happened, he was a probably 17 years old, and he was having a, a break or a psychotic episode 
he had gone to a neighbor's house and was sitting in their yard. He wasn't doing anything, um, but but he was trespassing. <laughs> yeah. And this neighbor was not a friendly person. Mm-hmm. Probably like I hate to say it, but the kind of perhaps cop who might shoot a mentally ill person. Yeah. Uh, suddenly, um, he didn't know how to handle that situation. And uh, Daniel was with our dog and just sitting in the man's yard. Um, another neighbor, just coincidentally, had a totally different tack. Daniel would go sit in his yard with the dog, and he was fine with Daniel. Mm-hmm. But this particular neighbor was not, and Daniel pushed him uh, and then ran off with the dog, came home. The police came mm-hmm. within probably – I didn't know about any of this as it was happening, but – Half an hour later or so, the police came to the mm-hmm. door. Anyway, long story short, they began to put Daniel in the squad car to take him in for a psych evaluation. And he, just, and he was very compliant and appeared very cooperative, like he was not going to give them any trouble, and then just suddenly bolted. And I kid you not, this, was, this happened on July 4th. Um, It was a very hot day. The sun was just beating down on us. This happened outside of our house. And he takes off down the street. It's a straight shot for probably, oh, at least a quarter of a mile, just straight. And I watched this young man run. I'm telling you, he looked like an Olympic sprinter. Hmm. To what I was saying earlier about him being an amazing athlete. Yeah. And (laughs) but running the wrong way, right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and I remember, I was, I don't know if I actually looked up and said, God, I hate you, Yeah. but I felt it. Mm-hmm. I felt it. Mm-hmm. I was just angry, mm-hmm. angry. Well, there's a tremendous hopelessness and isolation when those things happen. And any of us who have dealt with that with our children, um, it's it's such a, a helpless feeling as a, a parent, and you feel like you're all alone. No one really understands. Um, you you're you're trying to be an advocate for your child, and I think, you know, as I listen to your inner struggle, um, you know, I've been there, and when I look at scripture and I see these biblical characters, if you want to put it that way. I don't like using that term because I don't want to ever give the impression the Bible's just a a made-up story, but these people wrestled at a deep level with God before God was able to use them in the way that he wanted to, in the way that would be best for them and best for his redemptive program, you know. So I think that the good news in what you're saying is that those who are struggling at a deep level with God right now can say, you know, we can say, I think you and I would agree, it's okay. It's yeah, okay to struggle with God. Yes. Don't don't cut it short. No. Like, right? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Don't give up. Mm-hmm. Don't give up because he's working in you mm-hmm. um, something, you know, for his eternal glory. There's a scripture that says this light affliction, yep. or momentary affliction, is working in you a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory Um, and it is momentary Mm -hmm. and this is something that i have come to terms with 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 life with my son the good is also momentary so sometimes you want to hey wait don't rush off stay Mm -hmm. here a while longer the good Mm -hmm. Um, but but it's all momentary here Um, and yet whatever affliction is occurring it's for a purpose yeah sure tell me um we have just a couple minutes here. Why the movie, and mm. what do you want to say in this film that you're putting together? Right. I, I want to bring honor to my son. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's certainly one thing I really want to do. And uh, by telling his story, which is very much tied in with his family's story, in fact, the movie, quite honestly, tells more the father's story in a way. It, I mean, let's be honest, it, it does. Um, but the son is still, they're, they're together, you know, the father and son, that's, that's the story. So I wanna, I wanna 
dignify my son. I want to, you know, um, it's, it's hard to think about, but mm-hmm. he, he's locked away, basically. Mm-hmm. You know, he's out of commission. Yeah. Uh, our young man here who's on one of the cameras, uh, you know, he's free. His life is mm-hmm. in front of him. He's engaging. You're engaging in your creative impulses. Well, he has to work with us, <laughs> but that's the downside. But Yeah. Yeah. And my son is yeah. shut out from society and meaningful interaction with people. And it's, it's sad. So I want to tell this story. I want him to come out of the shadows, you know. Good for you. It's called Let Me Have My Son. Why that title? Well, it came out of one of those prayer letters I wrote years ago. And I wrote a book, actually, that's going to be re-released in a few months, probably toward the end of the summer, called Let Me Have My Son. <clears throat> it, was, it, it, it was something I wrote in a letter where I was telling my prayer team, my supporters, prayer supporters out there, friends of Daniel, um, for years, I've been telling the hospital that was in Virginia, the psychiatric hospital. Okay, you guys have been working on him and doing your thing. Now it's my turn. Let me have my son. Mm-hmm. Let me have my son. Because what I believed, and I still believe, maybe not as radically as I did then, but I still believe, uh, well, it is as radical, really. My son will do better um, in, in a more humane surrounding and this is where i think we have it so wrong honestly and and not i guess i'll just speak for the united states yeah and how we treat the mentally ill yeah that there there's some that it's an illness too yes you know and it's a mm-hmm. it's a disease of the brain an illness of the brain i mean we we, st- we really don't understand it still you know and but hey you guys have had my son now for years and i don't see much improvement let me have him mm. let me have my son Mm-hmm. In fact, maybe that's the word "me" probably should be <laughs> capitalized above the other words. Yeah. But it, not that it's about me. But I'm his father. I, I provide a home. I provide yes. love. Yep. In the hospital, he's not al- uh, he's not allowed to receive any physical touch. Mm. Yeah, I mean, immediately that's a wow. Das ist verboten. German. This is forbidden. Mm. No touching. Mm. No touching. It's not allowed. Um, and they have all their reasons for it, but, you know, in my view, it's it's an overreach. Yeah. Um, so what does he get from me? The first thing he gets from me when I see him is a big hug. Good for you. Um, and I'm sorry, I've kind of veered from No, no, you're, you're do, no, you're doing, you're doing just fine. But uh, we have just a couple seconds left, so... Where can we watch for the film eventually when you've got that finished? Sure. Let me have my son. So we're looking for an October 2022 release. Okay. It it could be on Netflix. We're not sure at this moment, so I don't want to say it will be on Netflix. But as, but certainly all the streaming platforms, if if not also Netflix. 